and welcome, and thank you for coming to our virtual talks today. Uh, my name is Alex Okosi, and I'm the Managing Director for YouTube here in EMEA Emerging Markets. My pronouns are he, he, him. I'm really excited today uh, to be here as part of I Am Remarkable Week, uh, which is our digital experience featuring virtual talks, thought-provoking panels, online workshops, as well as confident boosting challenges that we've held between the eighth last week and running through the end of tomorrow, the 15th. I Am Remarkable is a Google initiative that really strives to empower everyone, particularly women and underrepresented communities to celebrate their achievements in the workplace and beyond. We are thrilled today to welcome Lovey Ajayi Jones, a New York Times bestselling author, sought after speaker, podcast host, who thrives in the intersection between comedy, technology, and justice. A 17-year blogging veteran, uh, Lovey writes on awesomelylovey.com, covering all things culture with a very critical slant. She's also the host of a top-rated podcast, Professional Troublemaker, which we'll dig into, and is also the host of Jesus and Jalof, with actress and comedian Yvonne Orji. Lovey, welcome. And thank you for coming. Um, let's kick off this, this um, session with a, a question that we always ask our speakers. What makes you remarkable? Ooh, well, thank you for having me. What makes me remarkable is my commitment to making people feel joy, making them think critically, and compelling them to take action to make this world better than they found it. I think my career has been um, a testament of me feeling purpose-driven and doing the work that feels impactful, that feels just good, and then it's made impact. So I think that's what makes me remarkable is, um, yeah, I, I keep making impact with my words. That's, 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 what, that's what's up. Um, listen, everyone is excited about this talk, so we're going we're gonna to really get it, get it cracking today. But on, before we get started, we do want our audiences to kind of join us in a very small exercise, which is, so add their questions on our YouTube chat. Um, we're going to be we're going to be reading those during our Q and A sessions and um, and answering the questions. Lovey, can you share with us about Oriki um, and why it's so Im important and impactful to both write it down but to also read it? Yes. So in my book, Professional Troublemaker, I started off in talking about the importance of knowing who and whose we are. My book is about how we're gonna have to do scary things in this world to be audacious. You know, the life that we wanna live truly is at the other side of fear because that is my testimony. But to start living that life, you gotta be clear on what you stand on, you know, what you hold dear, what the important things are to you. So I talk about the Oriki. I was born and raised in Nigeria. I'm a Yoruba girl. And uh, one of the things about our culture is the Oriki, which is this tradition that ties you to who and whose you are. It talks about your lineage. It talks about where they're from. It talks about who you are now. It's basically setting a tone for your life. And I think about how in the diaspora, in the black diaspora, the Oriki is definitely a part of all these different traditions. It came with, with us. So you see it in rap. You see it in the way black folks, no matter where we're from, we hype ourselves up. So I think about the Oriki as like everybody, you know, people who used to watch Game of Thrones. You remember how they used to introduce, you know, Daenerys, the queen of the Andals, you know, breaker of chains, mother of dragons. That for me is Noriki, the way they used to, I used to listen to them introduce her and I'd be energized. I'd be like, dang, yes. So why can't we have our own Noriki? So I really introduced this idea because I think it's important for us to be able to hype ourselves up in a world that's constantly telling us not to, in a world that's constantly telling us that we are not good enough. So doing this exercise is an exercise in, in pouring gas on your fire when the world sometimes want to pour water on it. So yeah, that's what it is. And it's in chapter one. No, that's that's great. Um, clearly you're a Game of Thrones fan, so am I. And we, are, we got something else in common because as a Nigerian girl, I'm a Nigerian man. Um, you. you know, we are Nigerian, uh, I'm an Igbo boy. Um, um, at least I'd like to maintain that, but we are all together in this. But again, you touched on your story a little bit. I started to you know, talk about it. Can we kind of hear a little bit about your background, your story? Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be this remarkable person from sort of the beginning? 
I mean, I'm going to give you all the Cliff Notes version. But <laughs> um, yeah, born and raised in Nigeria. Moved to the United States when, when I was nine years old and was the first, it was the first time I was ever different. Um, but growing up, I wanted to be a doctor because I really knew I, early on that I wanted to be somebody of impact. And I was like, I want to help. So I decided that being a doctor was going to be that because being a smart Nigerian girl, that's one of the three, four options you're given. But when I started college and I got a D, okay, in chemistry, <laughs> it was the deading of the doctor dream. It was an instant it was an instant catalyst for me to quit that dream. And there are times when we we're told often never quit. No, there are some things that you should quit. If it's not for you, if it's not truly for you, let it go. So I quit the doctor dream and I kept it moving, but I kept on writing. You know, I started writing 18 years ago with no expectation. I started a blog back in college that kind of talked through my, 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 my undergrad journey. Um, when I graduated with my degree in psychology, I didn't stop that blog. I, well, I did, actually. I deleted that blog and started a brand new one. And all of that was giving me practice of telling the truth out loud in public. Um, without the agenda, without the strategy of like, I'm going to make a career of this. I spoke real truths, you know, without deceit. So got laid off my full-time job as a marketing coordinator April 2010. And I basically never got a chance to get another job. Um, I was doing branding and marketing for small business owners and bloggers while my blog was still taking off. And I realized a few years later that my purpose is to use my words, that I am a writer, that I am supposed to be outside the box. So ever since I've written two New York Times bestselling books, my That's first book, I'm Judging You, The Do Better Manual, actually came out five years ago. Yesterday was the anniversary mm -hmm. of five years that changed my life. It allowed me to retire my mom. It gave me access to rooms I didn't even know existed. And um, I just came out with Professional Troublemaker, the Fear Fighter Manual in March, also hit the Times list. And has continued to build on this life that I'm, I'm creating, this life of impact. Wow. Five years ago, you wrote your first one. Yesterday was the anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Did you do anything to celebrate that before we move on to your new book? What did you do? Did you turn up a little bit? No, go outside? I did no, I did nothing. I, I actually wow. I was working. I was working all day. You know, I didn't have a chance to really kind of like pause. I think, you know, it's it's I usually am just on to the next. The five years is a major mark. I marked it by Absolutely. talking about it on social media, but I didn't do anything special outside of that. You know, I'm always looking at what I need to get done, which gift and curse. No, I hear you. I hear you. That's definitely. That's definitely the gift. Um, now, moving on to your book, right? Um, just kind of starting off from in terms of grasping it and reading it and sort of consuming it. One of the, one of the people that you seem to really, really, that you dedicated the book to was, of course, your grandmother, um, who you you really, you know, delve into in the book in terms of the inspiration that she start, served for you. Can you tell us what inspired you to write this book um, and landed at the professional troublemaker um, title? Yeah. So the professional troublemaker title really came to be because I think it does capture what I do as a truth teller in this world. Um, my TED talk, Getting Comfortable with Being Uncomfortable, that dropped in 2017, it was another moment that changed my career. Um, and in the TED talk, I talk about how we need to commit and make the habit of fighting fear, of doing the things that scare us, because that truly is part of my journey is that in the moments when I have done the scary thing, I, I've been rewarded for it. So when it was time to write this book, after writing my first one, because I'm judging you, the Do Better Manual is about how we all have terrible habits in this world and we can fix it. All right. And we need to make impact in this world. And then professional troublemaker is like, all right, for us to do better, for us to make this impact, we're going to have to make some trouble. Um, so the book is the how to I'm judging you's what. And the first words of that TED talk that I did is I'm a professional troublemaker. Because I realized that for you to be somebody who's constantly committed to fighting your fears, doing the things that are scary, it means you are going to disrupt rooms that you're in. It means you are going to make people uncomfortable. You know, it means you're going to make yourself uncomfortable a lot. And um, I think it's necessary. This world does not have enough troublemakers. I think about the late, great John Lewis, who says, always be ready to make necessary good trouble. 
I think trouble is good because when we live in a world that's full of injustice, you making trouble means you are trying to fix it. You know, you're trying to go against the status quo. You are trying to be a person who is fighting for justice. And I think it's a badge of honor to be a troublemaker. So but how do you look? First of all, your TED talk was was fantastic. And I'm sure you know about that. Everyone's bigging it up. I actually saw that like was it a couple of years ago. And I was like, wow, she's amazing. She's dynamic. And I consumed it and I kind of moved on until all of a sudden you came back full circle as part of this interview. Right. So I had to listen to it again to be inspired, to make sure I could engage um, in this conversation in a way that uh, people will enjoy. But love the TED Talk. For anyone that's watching this, you haven't, if you haven't seen it, please go check it out again. But how do you how do you determine which trouble is worth making? Right. Like how do you how do you pick which one is worth making? Because that's the, you know, it's it's great to say I'm a tr professional troublemaker and obviously make sure that you are pushing for what's right. Well, how do you determine when, which one, how far? So when we think about making trouble and when we think about being a person of impact in this world, we're thinking about taking big actions, right? We're like, okay, I'm going to have to speak up in tough moments and I'm, I'm going to speak up about racism. I'm going to speak up about sexism. That's always necessary. But I think making trouble comes even in the small moments, right? When we think about how do you make trouble, it's even in times when you have to tell a friend, hey, let's have a tough conversation. It's in times when you are sitting in a meeting and somebody gives a terrible idea about a campaign and you have the courage to say, I think we should be a little bit more thoughtful because that might not go that well. When we think about troublemaking, I think it's less about taking these massive actions all the time and more about embodying courage. You know, when I wrote this book, I wanted to, I wanted this book to loan people courage. What a lot of people said about my TED talk was that it spurred them to do something different. People send me messages every day about what this talk did for them. It pushed them to ask for the raise. And that's what I went to, that's the energy of this book. I think about my grandmother's life and why I dedicated this book to her. She was a troublemaker, not because she was always saying rah, 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 sexism, racism. No, it was because she moved in this world in a way that was unapologetic about her presence. Even that is troublemaking. When you are a black woman, when you are an African woman, and my grandmother was not like formally educated past maybe eighth grade. When you are able to move around this world without asking for permission to show up as yourself, even that's making trouble. So instead of us thinking about the big moments that we're like, oh my gosh, I have to do something big. Your very presence can be making trouble. You know, when you are one of few in a room, right? When you are like the only black person, the only woman, the only mm -hmm. person who's trans, even that is making trouble. Your very presence disrupts the status quo and take pride in that. Sometimes we, we let it make us shrink. Sometimes we let it take the air out of our body. But I'm like, if I'm the only in the room, it's not necessarily a point of pride in that I want to maintain the only status. I say, if I'm the only in the room, my job is now to make sure when I walk out, the next time I walk back in, I'm not the only. I want to make sure that I use my power if I am the only in that room to make sure that somebody else comes in who looks like me. And because we're always so afraid of disrupting rooms or we don't want to rock any boats, we'll be quiet. We'll get the raise and all of a sudden we get quiet and we don't even advocate for the next person behind us because we don't want to shake anything up. We were just like, well, I'm here now. No, no, no. You're here now. Don't get comfortable because just so you're in there does not mean it's safe to be in there by yourself. Pull in somebody else who has less power, less access, less voice. You know, people, people need to know that when you are in the room, the room will be better for it. They might not realize that it's going to be better until you walk out, but you know that, you know, I'm always pushing myself to be proud of what happens in any room that I'm in. Because if I was in the room and something happens and I have to justify my presence, what do I say when somebody says, so what you say when they said that terrible joke? And I got to be sit there and be like, I, I mean, I laughed a little. Oh my gosh, can't justify that. You know, what did you say when they didn't want to give the person the raise, knowing that they deserved it? I didn't say anything. How does that make me proud? So I always also ask myself, if I'm asking like, in what moments does trouble make a difference? Well, does my inaction 
or does my silence make me proud? Is mm-hmm. actually the question that I ask myself. Mm-hmm. Is will I be able to justify my inaction, my silence? If I can't, sis, speak up, speak up, say something. No, so, so that's that's interesting because it, it, it means that making trouble, right? As you articulate it, you know, so you know so very well in the book, but also as you as you started to do it now, there's kind of like some three core fundamental concepts around it, right? Which is do you mean it, which you, which is what you talked about? How do you justify it? Um, but the last is also, can I do it in a thoughtful way? And do I have an answer? Correct? Is that is that sort of being able to sort of make sure that you, because to give you the courage to do this, and to make sure that you're always stepping into your truth, you almost need to always check it, right? And go through those filters and make sure that you're not just making trouble for the heck of it, but you're making trouble because you believe it is important to stand for truth. Absolutely. I think um, having a checkpoint is just, it mitigates risks. You know, when I do want to say something that feels tough and I ask myself those three questions, it is to check in with myself, first of all, and to make sure that I am doing it in the best way possible and not just from a place of anger. Um, How we say something matters. Now, it doesn't mean you do your checkpoints of, do I mean it? Can I defend it? Can I say thoughtfully? And everybody's going to love what you say. No, it is not to force people to love the impact. It is just to make sure you stay in your own integrity. Um, So, yeah, the way I make sure I do that, if the answer is yes to all three of those questions, I say the thing and I deal with however the thing falls, right? Mm -hmm. But those types, it also helps quantifying my decisions. I'm a fan of doing that all the time. Like, we have so many different decisions we have to make every day. How can you make it more of a math problem? (laughs) <laughs> right. So if the answer is not yes to all three of those, maybe I should be quiet and revisit it. And if the answer is yes, I should actually speak up. So it makes my life easier to also not constantly be stuck in analysis paralysis. No, you're absolutely right. Because I think that analysis paralysis is where people get caught and they lose the moment. Right. They lose the opportunity to actually um, seize the moment and make sure they live in their truth. But, you know, and in that in that construct, right, there are people that are always a little bit afraid to sort of gain the, the space to speak up and be heard. What advice would you give them, right? So if they've kind of, they see something or they 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 feel something, they notice something, they've kind of, they follow your guide, which I think is great. They've kind of gone through this filter, but now they want to make sure that they're able to gain the space to speak and to be heard. What advice would you give them? Figure out what you're afraid of. Um... A lot of times when we don't use our voice or use our power, I mean, it comes down to fear. We're afraid of something, whether it's fear of rejection, fear of punishment, you know, fear of being wrong. And then ask yourself what the actual consequence is of the worst case scenario that you're afraid of. So is it you're afraid of being fired because you speak up about a campaign in a meeting? Well, the worst case scenario is that you get fired. Okay, so what happens if you get fired? Do you have a savings account that can at least keep you off the streets for a bit? Do you have friends who would put you up? Do you have parents who would be like, at any point, come lay on my couch? But we're thinking about the apocalypse version of that worst case scenario, right? As if that means we get fired, nobody hires us, our (laughs) savings account is dry, we have no credit. It takes a lot for the apocalypse version to happen. But I think we give that thing so much power so then we don't do it. What is most likely to actually happen if you challenge the idea? Okay, most of the time, what's at stake is that we make the room uncomfortable for 10 minutes. Okay, so that's temporary. We just need to stop giving so much power to unlikely scenarios, which then means we will opt out of the best case scenario because we're afraid of the worst case scenario that might never come. So I want us to just be really logical about it. I think, you know, we talk about fear fighting and I'm like, even if you are a pragmatic person, a very logical person, which I am, you can be very logical about the fact that some of our fears are unlikely and move with that knowledge, move forward with that confidence. No, listen, I, I, I completely agree with you, but as a person of color, right? Um, even as a woman, you know, cause that's a, that's kind of like the double effect, right? Double it's not, it's not, it's not easy. 
I mean, no. I, I can even tell you as a black man, it's not easy to always be that that one uh, no. in the room because it carries with it a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and you know, you're in that room that's the only voice, and you're the one that is speaking truth to the room that people may not want to hear. And people get afraid of being branded professional troublemaker, right? Let's just call it that, because it carries with it the I, the notion sometimes that people fear that it will mean that it's, it's career limiting, right? It, you know, all of a sudden they're not as collaborative, they're not as you know, they're not playing for the team, uh, when in reality um, they're they're speaking the truth actually will elevate the team if in, you know if everyone listened. And I know you I know you've given some advice in terms of how to approach that, but what do you say to that fear, right, of just being branded and you now have to go through and try to navigate a career um, in that context? I think that fear is very valid, and I see and I affirm it. I sit here as a black woman who's an immigrant who is very bold about her words and how she moves through the world, knowing that it is a risk, you know. What I'm actually saying about being professional troublemakers is actually less to the people who are constantly taking risks, which is our, which are usually people who look like us. Black and brown people are the ones who are the only in the room who, in spite of many reasons to shut up, will still be courageous and use our words. And then we do get punished for it, right? My hope is that somebody who's watching this, who is a leader, who is white, who is male, feels convicted that the next time that you hear somebody in the room who looks like me challenge an idea, that you start interrogating why you think this person's idea is aggressive, why you think just because they have passion, right? Just because we might use our hands, just because we might have more bass in our voice, just because when we talk, our whole body is engaged. Why do you feel threatened because somebody showed up with their full body in the room. Why do you feel like this person's words are less valid because they're not couched in compliment sandwiches? I'm hoping that people understand that when we talk about making trouble and disruption, disruption comes with a diversity of expression, right? So we talk about diversity and equity and inclusion right now, and people are hiring more black people and more brown people and more gay people, more trans folks. That diversity that you are saying that you want to have in the company should also come with a tolerance, celebration, and welcoming of diversity of expression, which means the coworker who shows up with the red hair or who shows up with the bald cut or who shows up in whatever package that they show up in and who is in the room is not looked at as aggressive for not being fake polite in the meet in the meeting who is like hey i just want to call this thing out i want us especially in this era where it's supposed to be black square era where all the companies were putting up oh my god we support black lives matter you can't support black lives matter when your black employees can't speak up in meetings because they're going to get written up by hr you can't wow. support black lives matter when the black woman feels like if she comes to work with her hair in its natural state, she's gonna get a ding for not being looking for, for not looking professional. So that's what I mean is like there are troublemakers who are ready to take control at organizations, who are ready to elevate the rooms. And if you don't have them, it's because you've silenced them. It's because you've mm -hmm. let them know that them showing up in their best ways and their with their best selves will get them punished. So what happens? People shut up. People don't challenge and make sure that you're doing the best work possible. That's how mm -hmm. campaigns show up on social media that are wildly, wildly <laughs> insulting and terrible. There was somebody in that room who wanted to say something, who knew they were too different and who saw that they would get punished. So my challenge to leaders at any company is that they celebrate the disruptors that they start figuring out what role have I played in silencing troublemakers? What role have I played to say this is not the place where your truth is necessary and welcome? And I think that's important. For those of us who constantly put ourselves on the line, we do it in spite of the fact that we are in rooms where we're not celebrated. We do it in spite of the many reasons we have to not do it. And we should be rewarded for it as opposed to punished Wow, we gotta we gotta definitely marinate on that, Anna. And I think it's an, it's a great call out to 
leaders, right? Um, because at the end of the day, it's not just about having people in the room. It's not about having women in the room. It's not about having um, diverse rooms with, uh, with everyone in the room, but it's about enabling them. It's about effectively empowering them and making sure that you set them up for success by allowing them to show up fully as they are. A lot of, and, and a lot of companies them to talk. are definitely just talking the talk without walking the walk. And that's frustrating. A mm -hmm. lot of companies are wondering why they're bleeding talent and why people don't stay past five months or six months or a year. Why really talented people will show up and not do well at their jobs. It's because those talented people who look like you and I have microaggressions thrown at them constantly. You know, they've had insensitive comments. They've had bosses who are white and male disrespect them every day and they have nobody advocating for them. So when we talk about troublemaking and I can show up here in all my loviness because <laughs> I was invited here and you enjoy the words that I'm hearing, that I'm saying, and you're like, oh my God, I love that lovey said it. When I walk out of this room and the person who doesn't have the lovey name currency says the same thing and they get punished, what you just showed is that I had to show up as the keynote speaker who was paid to be here for my words to be valid. Meanwhile, my words are no more valid than the person who's already said the same thing, who works next to you. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. leaders really challenge themselves to see outside of, of the work that they're doing and, and how they're contributing to spaces that don't grow because they've silenced the disruptors. Wow. Hmm. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take that in a little bit. Now, um, I want to go to Q and A, but I want to, I want to ask one more question. I'm trying to be a little selfish about my questions so I can get it all in. Um, you talk about that, right? So, how do we make sure that leaders enable that? But what have you seen any examples of companies that? foster that environment or that you've heard of, that you've experienced. And I know you from the outside, but I'm I'm sure you got friends and everyone, um, everyone, their mom before this this talk pinged me to say, can you ask her this question? I'm, I told them they got to show up and ask the question in the chat and I will ask it, right? Because otherwise, you know, I, we're not going to get through them all. But, you know, what, what can companies do to actually make sure that they are enabling those that you know, you call them disruptors. Sometimes people take that as a negative comment, you know, that has a negative connotation. But the reality is that they are they are people that really enable us to grow because we cha they challenge our thinking so that we can be better. But what do you think companies can do to enable those kinds of environments? I want people to understand that the world that we live in right now was built by disruptors. The fact that we can fly in a tin can and it will take us from one city to another in 45 minutes is disruption. So I need us to get comfortable with disruption. It's a positive thing because if you don't have disruptors in the world, you don't have electricity. You don't have the person who says, mm, we should probably do, we could probably get this without having to light a candle, right? So welcome disruptors knowing that you need them. Disruption is innovation. So the good framing of disruption is innovation. They mean the same thing, right? So innovators and innovation comes at the end of truth telling and taking risks. How companies can foster this, enable this, is to actually put it into action. I, I've been running my company for the last 10 years. I have a team of six. And I try to create this environment myself. And what, I, what that looks like, and you actually have to prompt people in meetings, when I'll give an idea to my team, as CEO, they might be afraid of challenging me because I hold all the keys. If they all agree with me, I say, y'all ain't got no questions about this? All of, you, <laughs> all of you like this idea? What? What am I missing? What is the blind spot that I'm not seeing? And then they start going, okay, yo, I have this question. What happens at the end of that session is all the things I had not thought about, all the blind spots I had, have been handled because my team was able to think for me. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how disruptive you are as a person. You ain't got all the answers. So it's actually in your best interest to ask people to challenge you because that's how you're gonna create the best work. That's how you're gonna make sure all bases are covered. 
That's how you're going to make sure the campaign is not trash. Okay. Right. Like that's how you're going to make sure that you've thought through all the things, how companies need to do that. Literally welcome it into the room. If you are leading the meeting, if you are HR, VP of the department, put it in the policy. One of my company's core values is radical transparency. Like I put it in my company's core values because I want you to know when you walk in my door, whether remote or not, and you work for me, I need your honesty in the room as much as I need your skill. I need that because that's what is going to allow us to create the best work possible. So yeah, companies make this a part of your action. Make it a foundational value for the work that you are doing that people who work for you can show up as themselves without threat of punishment. And that you encourage them yes. to participate and that you yeah. actively seek their participation um, so right. that, yeah, no, no, thank you for that. All right. We're going to move on because um, we could definitely be here for a couple more hours and, and, I'm, and I'm sure your gospel will be still be still be hitting. Um, but let's move on to the Q&A questions um, and see if, what we've got from the audience. So Emmy says, hi, lovey. What's your advice for companies when it comes to embracing troublemakers? I think I've kind of asked that a little bit, so sorry. Um, so, you know, she's um, she says, hashtag, we have a bureau of troublemaking where I work. You should drop by. And I see and I see her follow up question in the chat that says troublemaking can be lodged as a pejorative term. Let me tell you something right now. People can turn anything into a pejorative term. Disruption can be a, trouble, uh, a pejorative term. Truth can be a trouble uh, a troublemaking term. Right. I don't think it's about flipping the script. Here's I actually wrote this book with the intention that when people see troublemaking, it does instantly give them great vibes because they think about me, this truth teller who shows up in the world. Be less worried about people's ideas of you and be more worried about how you're staying your integrity. If they consider me a troublemaker, but I do excellent work and I make myself indisposable in that way, call me a troublemaker all you want, but I'm still going to show up and be amazing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care if you don't like me, but if I show up and create the best work possible, you're still probably going to have to deal with me because here I am. And I sit here as the, as the ultimate troublemaker, somebody who speaks up about a lot of different things, who ruffles feathers often. And I'm thriving in spite of and because of it. So when we start worrying about flipping that script, when we start worrying about, oh, my God, I don't want to be a great... We won't show up as our best selves. We won't do our best work. And it ends up being, a, you know, kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, um, yeah, like, I'm not with that. So thanks for that question. Emmy, I know Emmy works for us at X, and she is, honestly, love you. She over there making trouble. Trying to make Let's sure go. That, you know, Let's make go. Sure that, we, that we're creating and innovating. So um, next question. So Anya says, um, can you recall a time where you didn't manage to overcome your fears and what did you learn from it? I mean, here's the thing is courage cannot be present without fear first, because if you weren't afraid, you were not really that courageous because it was easy. Mm. Right. Mm. Those are moments by moment decisions that you make. I think courage is a decision. It's not just you were born courageous and you were born brave. Every time you have a chance to speak the truth or do something that feels difficult, you're having a chance to be courageous. So, yeah, have I had moments where, I, where I've let fear stop me? Absolutely. But in those, but the next thing that I am prompted to do, I can choose to be courageous in that moment. It's never too late. And if it is, if you wanted to say something and you were like, oh, I didn't say something because I didn't know what to say, the moment has passed, I think you can still circle back with people. And say, hey, I didn't have the words earlier, but I do. Here's what I wanted to say that I, that I think is still important. Don't think one moment leaves and all of a sudden you've lost your chance. Mm. You can always mm. circle back and say, hey, I know I didn't speak up in the meeting before, but I really think this point is important to make. I think we should reconsider this idea. I think here's a question we should ask ourselves. Go circle back with somebody. You know, so a moment that fear stops you, know that you have another chance to do or say something. Wow. I love that one. Um, I think that's powerful, uh, especially in, in, in today. There's no reason why you can't circle back. 
Um, so that's an amazing response. I see. I see. I see a question that I actually want to want to uh, answer in the comments. Somebody ahead, said, "I'm ahead. not sure. I agree with the point that when you fought for a race for yourself, you should bring someone in the room to fight for a race for them." Because I see salary is confidential. So, fun fact: completely disagree with everything you just said. Let me tell you why. Salary is confidential, and a lot of companies have policies. So I'm not saying go against company policy and share your salary. But you know what happens when everybody's salary is confidential? Somebody is getting cheated. Or a lot of people are getting cheated. And usually who's getting cheated looks like me. Usually the person getting cheated is a woman. It's somebody who's a minority of some sort. The reasons why a lot of companies stop us from talking numbers is because if you know your coworker is making $50,000 more than you doing the same job as you, now you actually have a leg to stand on to negotiate something better. You know what happens when we're constantly just me, me, me? Because America is a very individualistic uh, country and we're seeing why that does not work, okay, is that the me, me, me of it all, you think, because I advocated for myself, I'm good. What happens is when somebody else gets cheated, what makes you think you're not getting cheated? What makes you think your confidential number, that raise that you got, might still not be the number somebody else is getting from doing the same thing as you? The reason I want us to always double down on the, the community and the collective is that when we feel comfortable because we have gotten to a certain level of success without advocating or thinking about how other people's is happening, is that when it's time for us to be advocated for and we don't do the advocating, who is going? Who, who are we expecting to show up for us? It's so interesting. We find it necessary to advocate for ourselves, but then we don't think about the next person. And then when we need help and we go, I can't find help. We wonder why we're like oh my god nobody said anything did you say something last time somebody was being cheated no no but you want somebody to stand up for you i'm not saying you get your raise and all of a sudden you say hey boss give my co-worker a raise i'm saying when you're a person of power which i am which mm -hmm. a lot of you are and you're not using the power when you are a person who moves with more power than somebody else it is in your best interest to use your power for them also because then somebody else can use their power for you, okay? We are so selfish. We walk with so much selfishness and think, I'm good, everybody else is good. Nah, it's like if somebody else's house is on fire and you go, well, that ain't me, I ain't gonna call 911. That's called the bystander effect. You think somebody else is gonna do something. So you're less likely to do something. Well, who calls 911 when your house is on fire? So I'm always thinking like that. Like if I'm shutting up, who gonna speak up for me if I need them? So. I'm going to disagree with the idea that salary has to be confidential and that we should not speak up for somebody else in the room just because we just got the leg up. You're working at Google. Anybody who's on this call right now is a privileged person. I'm going to tell you that right now. You are doing very well for yourself. So nobody on this call is somebody who's living paycheck to paycheck. Nobody who's watching this right now is somebody who was like, I don't know what my next meal is going to come from. So we are the privileged ones. So if we don't feel the obligation and the conviction to use our power for people who have less privilege, then how is this world going to be better? How do we see higher ground? So yes, nah, unacceptable. Hmm. Hmm. Man, love you. You are, you are delivering a sermon that must be heard. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm, 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 I'm lost for words, but anyway, do you want to take another question from the chat or should I? Yes. Should I move on? Should I move uh, on and, and give you one from the? How do you be a troublemaker without being angry? Is one that's actually interesting. Oh, and any recommendations on how to work for a boss who is not who does not embrace troublemakers? How to work for a boss who does not embrace troublemakers? Oh, that's tough. I don't know if I can be a great person to give you an answer to that because. I haven't worked for anybody in a long time. <laughs> so <laughs> my answer is like, you probably won't work for them for long because they're going to squelch, squelch your soul. So I don't know how to work for a boss. You basically have to figure out whether the work is more important than this boss. You know, do you have other people who can advocate for you? This is also where having backup comes in handy. If you do work for a boss who doesn't embrace troublemakers, and you are the sole troublemaker on the team. Your life is going to be a little bit tough, I'm going to say, because you're going to be standing on islands by yourself constantly. Nobody's speaking up for you. 
And that's tough. And I don't know how to tell you to engage with that. I'm hoping either the boss moves on to a different company because the company realizes this is not the person that they want to lead a team or that you move on to another company where you will be embraced. And then for the question of how do you be a troublemaker without being angry? Um, if you instantly think troublemaker is about anger, I think you're missing the point. It's not about anger. You know, anger comes with helplessness. I feel like I can make change. How you hear me right now, I sound real passionate. Some people will hear that as anger. I'm not angry at all. That's passion. So mm -hmm. it's not about anger. It's about feeling the deep need to be a part of positive change in the world. And it's not always going to come in nice packages of like calm voice and zenness. And I think because we're so afraid of people seeing us as angry, we swallow all these thoughts down and then we don't do the thing we're supposed to do. I'm less concerned about people seeing me as angry and they can any day they want. Feel free to see me as angry. But even if you do see me as angry, what you will walk away with is, man, that's righteous anger. Or she made some points or she did the job. I did my job. Whether or not people see me as angry doesn't have anything to do with me. No, oh, wow. Hmm. Um, Lovey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going we're gonna to have to stop now. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Um, thank you for being remarkable. Um, on behalf of everyone watching us today, I think this has been an amazing opportunity to connect with you. Um, thank you. And thank you for your participation in I Am Remarkable Week. Um, lovey. My pleasure. You and I, are... just want, I want to leave people with this one thing. Yes, please. Um, I think courage is something that you can always choose. Do not think because you're somebody who's shy or you haven't spoken up before that you can no longer do and have these tough moments and deal with them gracefully and thoughtfully. You can always choose courage in the next meeting, in the next conversation with a friend, in the next action that you take in this world, in the next tweet that you post. And you know, I want people to grab professional troublemaker because for those moments when you are afraid, where you're like, what if they do see me as angry as, or should I speak up? I want this book and I want my words to loan you the courage you might not have for yourself. So I just encourage everybody to embody their own integrity and be exactly who makes you proud. So thank you so much for joining me. And you know, I want you guys to also come join me in Love Nation. I actually just created my own platform called Love Nation, L-U-V-V. N-A-T-I-O-N, because I want that platform to constantly loan people courage. You can come in there and talk about and get advice about the boss that's not embracing troublemakers. And you can come and be a part of the most lit business conference of all time, I think. So, yeah. I, I don't know what else to say, but I, I copped the book. I love it. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It is a great, great read. And um, I wish I can drop the mic for you, but you know, I don't have a mic, but let's just, just drop it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lodi. Thank you all for having me.